last time on HTML Canvas, Radu showed you how to draw snowmen using basic canvas drawing methods, mathematics, and coding principles. He showed you how to separate the code into functions to make it easier to read and more useful in practice. Now get ready, next lesson's about to start. Gonna code, debug, and have fun. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Gonna prototype and design. Coding with Radu. Coding with Radu. Let's code now. We start off with the same quick and dirty canvas setup. But I'm gonna spice it up a little bit and teach you some different CSS here. To make it visible, I'm gonna give it a solid border like this. Usually we're changing the background color. And uh, it's gonna have the same 400 by 400 size. Now let's start to write the JavaScript inside of the script tag like this. And uh, one even quicker way to access the canvas context is to write here directly my canvas. We don't really need to call that document get element by ID here really, because all of these IDs that we define here on the top become global variables in JavaScript by default. But this is not really a good practice because such variables get overwritten quite easily and then your code stops working and you don't know why. So continue using get element by ID in real projects, but here we do it quickly like this. Now let's learn how to animate using the canvas. We'll animate the simple circle moving from left to right. So let's give this circle a minimum x coordinate, let's say 100. And let's give it a range to move towards the right. I'm going to put this range on x is equal to 200. So it's going to move from 100 to 300 pretty much. And to control this movement, I'm going to use a variable called p. We initialize this to 0 and p stands for percent. So when it's at zero, it's gonna be at minimum x of 100, and when it's gonna be one or 100%, it will be at 300, or minimum x plus the range x. To animate, we call a function called animate, but we need to define this function ourselves. And it looks something like this. We begin to type here the function, like this, and let's update the x coordinate of this future circle like this. x is equal to the minimum x plus the range that we allow it to go multiplied by this percent value. And we want to increase this percent at each frame. So I'm going to increase it by a small amount. Let's say 0 0.02 like this. And now let's use this x to draw a circle. So begin path. And then we use the arc method to draw a circle at x. And I'm just going to use 200 for y. So basically middle vertically. And uh, the radius, let's just give it the radius of 20 and a full circle. So starting at zero and going to math by multiplied by two. And I'm just going to stroke this with the default stroke like this. And now to really animate this, to be able to draw this many times per second, I'm going to need to call request animation frame. It's a function that takes a parameter here, which is another function. And here we need to type animate one more time. So what this means is that request animation frame is going to call this animate function. But then when this runs, request animation frame will call it again and again and again. And this will cause a kind of infinite loop. And request animation frame will try to do this as fast as possible, but typically this means around 60 times per second. So let's save this file, refresh the page, and many things are going on. So 
what you see here is the circle being drawn again and again and again as it's moving to the right by a percent. And eventually, this P actually becomes greater than 1. So our circle goes outside of this range and all the way to infinity towards the right. We're gonna need to fix that. But first, I want to clear the canvas when drawing each frame. Otherwise, we get this trail that the circle leaves behind. And we don't want that. So I'm going to type here CTX clear rect. So I'm clearing a rectangle from the canvas and I will specify the full canvas size. So starting at 0, 0 in the top left corner and then my canvas width and my canvas height, like this. I save, refresh, and now the circle goes towards the right to infinity, but now it looks like the circle is actually moving, not leaving the trail like previously. So to stop P from going all the way to infinity, we can make a check here. If P is greater than one or greater than 100%, let's make it zero. So the circle is gonna jump back to the minimum X position. Let's save this and refresh. And now the circle just goes from left to right. And here really you can use a lot of math and, and programming if you want. So for example, let's define another variable called sign. I'm going to say that this is equal to one. And here where I'm updating P, I will multiply this 0.02 by this sign value. So basically I'm not changing anything really. But here, instead of putting P is equal to zero like this, I will say sign is equal to minus one. And if I save this and refresh the page, you will see that the circle changed direction and now it's going towards the left to infinity. And the reason is that now instead of going plus 0 0.02, it's going to go minus 0 0.02 after it reaches this uh, right side of the interval because the sign has changed at that point. So we can do the same thing for the left side if P is going to be less than zero, then let's make our sign is equal to one again. Refresh this, and now our circle just bounces back and forth like that. If you're really clever, you can actually change the code here a little bit like this. And essentially what you're saying is, if P is greater than 100% or less than zero, we are going to modify the sign by multiplying it by minus one. So basically we are changing the sign from plus one to minus one to plus one to minus one periodically like that, every time we are out of bounds. So if I'm gonna save this and refresh, the result is gonna be exactly the same but the code is simpler and somehow easier to understand. Now, if you're really good at math, you can try here something like multiplying by p twice. So multiplying by p squared, essentially. And when you refresh, you get a different behavior for your circle. It's kind of like it's uh, jumping on the right side wall or something like that. And you can actually play around with this website to understand better things like this. For example, if you type here a function x squared, like what happens here to our p, p squared, between 0 and 1, this function is going to look something like this. And it shows you that p or x or whatever your variable is, is going to start of increasing slowly, but then it increases quicker. And then this P starts to go backwards after the sign changes like that. So your animation starts off moving slowly and then increases speed and then quickly changes direction, still moving fast, and slows down again, and then speeds up and so on, repeating forever pretty much. 
So now you understand why this circle is doing that. But I'm not going to complicate our animation like this. I'm just going to undo this step and keep it moving uniformly as before. And instead, what I'm going to do is modify its radius as well. So let's do the same thing and say the minimum radius is going to be something like 10. And then let's give it a range as well. So the range of the radius is going to be maybe 20. So now the radius will go between 10 and 30. And um, we can use the same p value to animate the radius or something else, but I'm going to use p for now. So here we define a similar variable. Radius is equal to minimum radius plus range radius times p. And we have to use this radius here when drawing the circle. Now if I'm going to refresh, you will see the circle also increasing in size. So we don't just animate the position of the circle now, but also other properties like its size by changing its radius. And if you want to play with more math, then you can come up with different interesting things. Let's see what this looks like. So now the circle somehow increases in size, decreases in size according to the sine function. If I go back to this website and write here sine of x and I look what happens between 0 and 1, I notice that this sine is going to just increase like this. But that's not what's happening, is it? And the reason is I don't have just sine of p here, I have p multiplied by pi. So essentially I'm squishing this graph a little bit. So I'm going to open this and say times pi like this. And now if we look at the 0, 1 scale here, you see that what I've done is modified the sine function to become a kind of loop inside this 0, 1 interval. It's more complex than what we experimented before, but using tools like this, it's not that difficult, really. So try and play around with these things. See you guys.